Father, we thank you for this time here to just come and worship you. Again, we thank you for the blessings you give us, the many blessings that we have each and every day that we just take for granted. Father, we just pray that you be with each and every one that's listening, including those that are here. Father, we just pray, Lord, that you continue to bless this nation, even though we don't deserve it. And Father, we just pray for those godly pastors and missionaries out there that are trying to spread your word. Father, we just pray that you be with your servant. Bless this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to be continuing in our study here on Nahum. This will be Nahum part 3. And we're going to be picking up on Nahum chapter 2 verse 9. So Nahum chapter 2 in verse 9. Take ye the spoil of silver, take the spoil of gold, for there is none end of the store and glory out of all the pleasant furniture. Now Nahum seems to be speaking about the invading army that God commands to take a spoil of the city and to take all the gold and silver. You know, that was pretty common back in, in uh, the ancient times when an army went in, then they would try to take as much as they could, you know, they would, they, it was the spoils. You know, if the people had a bunch of gold or silver or whatever it was, you know, back then it was more stuff like that rather than necessarily military equipment type of things that we'd have today. But, you know, even over in Europe during uh, World War One and World War II, the, the conquering nations were doing that kind of stuff. You know, America never does that, but, you know, that was a common thing back then. And, you know, God was saying that these people are going to come and take a spoil of the city of all the gold and silver. Now, history says that very little gold or silver was ever found in Nineveh after its destruction, though some other valuables were found. You know, so it show that, uh, well, history also says that much of the city's gold was destroyed in the fire in the palace, including supposedly 150 golden beds. You know, whether, whatever it was, God says there were, it was a spoil, they were taken as a spoil. So I'm going to assume that a bunch of it was taken since that's what God's word says. But even if, if it was destroyed, either way, they no longer had this, this gold and the silver. But the city had great wealth due to the evilness of the Syrians who looted much from their captives over the years. Now it was payback as God took back from them and gave to their enemies. You know, the Nazis were big on that. They were going around stealing gold and so forth from all the people they conquered. And, you know, some of it's been recovered, some of it still never has. But, you know, the, the, the Syrians, as a, as a wicked people that they were, they were very much in, into all this looting and, and destroying of, of the nations they conquered. They took whatever they wanted, and now this was kind of God's payback. You know, I remember it says, that revenge belongs to the Lord, and that's, you know, this time he was allowing that revenge to be taken out on the Assyrians. Let's take a look at Nahum chapter 2, verse 10. She is empty and void and waste, and the heart melteth, and the knees smite together, and much pain is in all loins, and the faces of them all gather blackness. The city of Nineveh has become empty void and waste as her wealth is gone her people are gone and the city lies in waste with much of it destroyed and burned the faces of those left are black due to their sadness at seeing the city destroyed as well as some may have had actual soot on them from the burning city you know if you've you ever been around a big fire oftentimes Especially back then when a lot more stuff was made out of wood or, or other type of materials. Then you, you know, you get all this nasty shit and stuff. You know, you know, like from a fireplace, if you ever have a wooden fireplace where you burn stuff or, or coal fireplace or something like that, how much nasty shit gets, gets uh, all over everything. So, you know, it, it was a combination of their sadness. Their, was, their black was due to the sadness at seeing the city destroyed. But also, at, you know, from maybe from the possible soot from the burning city. But their heart melts and their knees strike each other as they mourn over the loss of Nineveh. Now, this same thing will happen during the tribulation as the people mourn over the destruction of Babylon that God destroys due to her wickedness and harlotry. 
Now this most likely refers to Rome rather than a rebuilt Babylon. People re uh, people gather in Nineveh or Babylon just do not want to yeah. people in Nineveh and Babylon or Babylon just do not want to give up their sinful ways and turn to God and mourn over their loss. You know, many in the United States are the same. Let's take a look at uh, Revelation chapter 18, verse 9. We'll take a look at Babylon here. So, Revelation chapter 18, verse 9. But, the, you know, these people, they just, the, the, just like they will with Babylon, the, the people don't want to give up their sins. You know, they, they mourn over, you know, people do that. They see a, a, a city that gets destroyed like this. And it's just a wicked city. You know, like the people with Sodom and Gomorrah. Even remember with uh, Lot's wife. You know, she even turned back when Sodom got destroyed. And when God told her not to. And she got turned into a pillar of salt. That, you know, people just mourn over the loss of, of the destruction of some sinful city. And what it represents. Let's look at Revelation chapter 18 verse 9. And the kings of the earth... Who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Let's go back to Nahum. So, Nahum chapter 2 and verse 11. But we saw in that verse there in Revelation how, you know, they just all upset, you know, over, over uh, the destruction of this sinful city. You know, Rome has been nothing with. Central city with the Roman Catholic Church there being in charge all these years. So back to Nahum chapter 2 verse 11. Where is the dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions? Where the lion, even the old lion, walked and the lions wept, and none made them afraid. Now Nineveh was a world powerhouse and many mighty kings had ruled from here with the whole world fearing Nineveh and her wickedness, just as the lion is the king of the jungle. The Assyrians were not afraid of anyone as they got too cocky in thinking they were invincible, yet God asked, where are they now? If some have said the old lion refers to Asher, who was the builder of Nineveh and the founder of the Assyrians. Let's look at that from uh, the table of nations there in Genesis chapter 10, verse 11. So Genesis chapter 10 and verse 11. Now Asher was one of the sons of Shem. Genesis chapter 10, verse 11. Genesis chapter 10 verse 11. Out of that land went forth Asher and builded Nineveh and the city Rehoboth and Calah. Now Asher built the city shortly after the flood, so it was an old city. He walked in the city, but he is no more just like the city and the rest of the young lions. That would be probably the kings of Assyria who resided in Nineveh. So none of these people were around anymore. You know, I told you... The last time that, that uh, you know, earlier in the study that the king of Nineveh is believed that he either intentionally killed himself by setting the, the, the palace on fire or either they set it on fire or he was captured one or the other. Hit, you know, hit, there's different opinions in history and scriptures, it's a little bit up for interpretation. But either way, you know, he, he was destroyed. And he was no longer in Nineveh. So we see that, you know, how the, these, these, the young lions as well as the old lion, none of them are around. Well, let's look at uh, verse 12. So Nahum chapter 2, verse 12. The lion did tear, did tear in pieces enough for his whelps, and strangled for his lionesses, and filled his holes with prey, and his dens with raven. Now the lion was the symbol of Assyria, and the third most important god of the Assyrians was Nergal, a god with a lion head. So we see the importance of uh, the lion. You know, we, a lot of nations then, 
especially in Europe and different ones, the lion was very symbolic of their royal crest. You know, even over in for England, they had the three walking upright lions, and then Scotland had the lion and so forth. Uh, the, this verse seems to be referring to how Assyria conquered other nations and plundered them, filling her dens, that's Assyria, with the spoiled goods. Remember, I just showed you where they were going around spoiling all these different nations, and then this time that God allowed them to get be the one to get spoiled. But they had, had filled up all their these dens that it's talking about here with all of their spoiled goods they've taken from their conquered nations. Let's look at Nahum chapter 2, verse 13. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will burn her chariots in the smoke, and the sword shall devour the young lions, and I will cut off thy prey from the earth, and the voice of thy messenger shall no more be heard. Now this verse speaks of God destroying the chariots of Assyria with fire, as God says he is against Assyria due to her wickedness. Now God says her young lions, that's the young men and soldiers, will be destroyed when the invading armies destroy Nineveh. Now God says Assyria will never again be a great power that will prey on the nations of the earth, and the voice of the people will no more be heard, as he will destroy the nation in the future. Assyria did survive for a few more years after the destruction of Nineveh before the nation no longer existed. But you know, from that point on, it was basically it, it was it was existing, but it was a it was a nothing nation. It would be kind of like the United States. You know, we always talk about one of these days if it doesn't straighten up, it might still exist, but it'd be equivalent to like a third world nation where you know it would never have the once power or glory that it, that it once had. But that's how Syria was that it. You know, it's this great empire with the world's largest city and so forth, and it turned around and it still existed, but it, it was it was nothing. You know, other nations were controlling it, and it had no influence on anything in world politics or nothing else. You know, and it was very small in number and people and territory and so forth. But it did survive for a little while, but eventually, then it went away. Chapter 2 has 13 verses, and I believe it is no coincidence as the number 13 means rebellion. And this is what the Assyrians had done in their rebellion against God with their idolatry and wickedness. And God had had enough, and he destroyed both Nineveh and the nation. You know, God will allow things to, to survive for a while. And this even goes for churches, but, you know, if you go in a nation, church, whatever it may be, you know, look at the, the seven churches there in Revelation where he said that, you know, if they didn't repent and so forth, he was going to destroy them. Well, it's the same thing with nations as well, that, you know, they don't turn from their wickedness, and so eventually God's going to destroy, you know, both the church and a nation. You know, God will let them stay around for a little while, but they'll never be nothing like the church will never be that lighthouse on, on the hilltop that it's supposed to be if it doesn't repent of the sins and so forth. Let's go to uh, the next chapter. Let's start Nahum chapter 3. So Nahum chapter 3 and verse 1. Woe to the bloody sea. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. God describes Nineveh as a bloody city. And he says woe is coming to the city. You know, remember there's the, those three woe trumpet judgments that will occur at, at the during the tribulation the last three trumpet judgments are considered woe judgments well you don't want god bringing woe to your to your nation or your people or yourself or something but he says that woe is coming to the city so that's not good now the syrians were well known for their bloodshed and savageness against their enemies including skinning people alive you know, just like the American Indians were always known for their scalping people and so forth like that. Well, the, the Syrians were supposedly, uh, they would skin all their people alive. Not just the scalp, but they would, you know, the whole people. Uh, I mean, it just shows how wicked and cruel they were and how they were definitely controlled by Satan. Now, God warned against shedding innocent blood. You know, he warned about that with Noah after the flood. 
that if you shed innocent blood, then your life is to be taken. You know, that was basically when government got instituted, and that was one of the main things for government was to enforce that if the capital punishment that people are trying to take away. You know, all these people that are trying to remove capital punishment. They're going against <clears throat> going against God's word. And, you know, God has clearly says you take them, another person's life, and that includes abortion, then their life is to be taken as well. Now, the city was full of lies and robbery as the Assyrians deceived people and stole from their captives. So we see, you know, look, let's look at this verse again. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The city, it's a bloody city because they've been nothing but killing people and they're bringing back the blood from the people. And, you know, everything they say, they're like Satan. They're controlled by Satan. So everything they say is a lie. You know, all the robbery I talked to, how they, they would take all the spoils of all these nations and bring them back. So we see this, this city was just full of wickedness. And yet, when it gets destroyed, you know, the people are, are, are sad and crying over it, just like with Babylon. And, you know, it just shows that there's no, no repentance or anything there. Not, not like when Jonah went there, you know, they had true repentance. These people, there was no repentance on them. Well, let's go to uh, Nahum chapter 3 and then verse 2. The noise of a whip, and the noise of the rattling of the wheels, and of the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots. So this verse speaks of the noises of the coming invading army. The chariot wheels will rattle as they speed towards the city. The noise of the running horses, as well as the whip against the horses to go faster, will be heard as there will be a great number of chariots in the invading army. So, I mean, it's going to be such a large invading army of all these chariots and the horses uh, driving them and so forth. And probably some on regular just horseback coming in. And, you know, they, they whip the, the horses to get them to go faster, you know, trying to get them to go come in at full speed. And I told you, uh, we saw on the last time in the study that we were showing how they were coming in. And, you know, they were trying to get through the street all at the same time, basically. And they, uh, you know, were competing for this, this, you know, who could be the first one in to come in and, and destroy Nineveh. So that's what this verse is talking about, the rattling of the wheels. That's the chariot wheels and the jumping chariots because they're going so fast, they're probably bouncing off the, off the ground. You got to remember, they didn't have paved roads and stuff like we have. So, you know, on them dirt roads and stuff, and you, know, you get on one of these county roads and dirt roads, where they're all, all bumpy and so forth, and you're going at high speeds, especially in the chariots, and there's not a lot of weight there. They'd be bumping up and jumping up and down, and the horses are prancing because they're running so fast and so forth. So that's what this is talking about here, this invading army that's coming in at full steam ahead to try to uh, hurry up and capture Nineveh. Well, let's look at Nahum chapter 3, verse 3. The horsemen lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses, and there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. This verse, just like verse 2, continues describing the invading army, how the invaders come with bright swords and spears. This verse describes how the invading army had killed many people with the corpses all over, with no end, and the great number of dead is causing the horses and people to stumble as they try to get over all of the dead people. This well describes the nation of Assyria as a whole that was full of dead corpses that had rejected Jesus. The United States was quickly following suit to become just like Assyria, and we too will one day be destroyed by God for our own wickedness. But, you know, I'll go back to this description here, you know, I mean, think about it. These, as I said, these people are coming in at full steam and, on these chariots and so forth. And they were killing so many people that the, the corpses, they were just in a way as the horses on the chariots were trying to come in and people were trying to run in the, the, uh, the, the infantry troops to be trying to come in. And they're trying, you know, there's so many dead bodies they're trying to like step over them, they're tripping over them and everything else. And, and you know, that's what God's describing here. That's what it's showing there was such a great slaughter of the Assyrians. And of course, there'd be some dead of their own people as well. But, you know, there was this great slaughter of Assyria. Because God had had enough of their wickedness. I mean, they, they had, God had given them many, many chances to repent, and they, they refused. So God finally said, enough's enough, and he had them destroyed. 
Let's move on to verse 4. So Nahum chapter 3, verse 4. Because of the multitude of the whoredoms of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms and families through her witchcrafts. Now this verse speaks of the great whoredom of idolatry in Assyria and the witchcraft in the nation and how she exported her idolatry and witchcraft around the world when she forced the conquered nations to worship her false gods. In verse 5, well, before we move on, I mean, you know, talk about exporting her, her idolatry and witchcraft. You know, and I mentioned that before, but the United States of America, you know, we've done the same thing. You know, with Hollywood, we've spread our sinful movies all over the world. We've taken our other many sins that we have, and we, we, that's what we do. We export them all over the nations and all over the world. That, you know, it's bad enough we, we have them here, but you know, that's not good enough. We want to make sure that the whole rest of the world gets all of our sins and filth. And that's exactly what Assyria was doing. Well, let's look at verse 5 now. So Nahum chapter 3, verse 5. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy wickedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. So God says he is against Assyria. You never want God against you, as this is a sure sign of your doom. You cannot fight against God. You know, that's what many people think. They think they can fight against God, but you cannot fight against God. And, you know, if, once God turns against you, that's you're not going to win that battle. You know, if God's not on your side, you know, it says in Scripture that, that he who is in you, that, that's Jesus, is greater than he who, he who is in the world. That's referring to Satan. You know, that, that if we're a true Christian... We don't have to fear what Satan should try to bring to us because we have God fighting for us. And so, no matter what it may be, you know, we will be victorious. Even if it's not in this lifetime, we will get the victory in the end. Now, God saw, said her nakedness would be shown to the whole world. The whole world would see and know of her destruction and how her false gods could not help her. Remember, I've said that where she was bragging to uh, Israel, uh, Judah, rather, that no other gods, you know, the, what, why is your God, you think your God can be any different, going to be able to defeat us, that you know, all these other nations, where are their gods? They couldn't do anything to help them out. Well, God showed them that he is, his God is much more powerful than them when he destroyed that 144,000 Assyrians. But now it's Assyria's turn, you know, where's her gods? You know, we saw that they have multiple gods. I showed you that said well ago that the third most uh, important god was this lion god. You know, and they had multiple other gods and goddesses and stuff as well. But where were they when the time came that God decided he was going to destroy her, her and the whole world was going to know about her destruction? I mean, again, you know, they didn't necessarily have the communications like we have today with the internet and so forth. But trust me, when, when a world power such as Nineveh and the major city is, I mean, as Assyria and a major city as Nineveh gets destroyed, it's not going to take long for word to get out. You know, God will make sure that it gets out. Now, her sins would be exposed for all to see, and there was nothing she could do to stop any of it. You know, God, God talked about that when he said, that, you know, the sins, you know, what is said in secret that he would expose from the the rooftops and you know that's basically what he was doing here is you know he was exposing all of her sins to the whole world and there wasn't anything that she'd be able to do to stop it now Nineveh would be completely destroyed with everything exposed for the world to see just as, as God had said let's look at uh, and when we see even here you know with the United States of America I bring that up all the time just because I want people to wake up and see what's going on in this nation that we need to be praying for it because you know our leaders are, are evil wicked people and they're trying to bring destruction to this nation and you know they're following a lot of these patterns that we see in scripture here where you know you see even now how some of the the sins of the, of the politicians are being exposed to the world that that it's, you know, you, they're not going to hide them. God will reveal the truth of what's going on. Let's look at Nahum chapter 3 and verse 6. And I will cast abominable filth upon thee and make thee vile, 
and will set thee as a gazing stock. So God will cover up the city with filth and make it vile that no one will want a part of it. It will become a gazing stock for all to see how this once mighty city was now destroyed. People in that day would take a whore and strip her and cast filth upon her. And this is a description of the city used by God. This city will be coerced or be covered, sorry, will be covered in filth just like the whore for all the world to see. You know, if you, if you look at history, history shows that that's how the, the city was. It, you know, after it was destroyed, there was a few people that lived there briefly. But for the most part, it was just piled up rubble that you know had been burnt down, destroyed, and all the things like the scripture where it says there was there was nothing there. You know, it was just this big pile uh, of filth. You know, all their sins and so forth. You know, a lot of it just being burnt. You know, it's going to cause all that told you that soot and so forth. It, it, you know, it's a filthy thing. If you've ever been into a, a, a house or something after it's burnt down. You know, it's had a major fire inside. You know, you start trying to walk around, and it's just nothing but this this filth and, and, and from all the, the soot and smoke and and destruction and so forth. And that's basically what was was happening here with the city. Now let's look at uh, Nahum chapter three and verse seven. And it shall come to pass that all they that look upon thee shall flee from thee and say, Nineveh is laid waste. Who will bemoan her? Whence shall I seek comforters for thee? Nineveh will be so greatly destroyed that all will flee from her as it has become a waste and barren city. You know, what was once the largest city in the world was now barren and laid waste. You know, I said there was just a couple stragglers, like, you know, some uh, vagrants or whatever that lived there temporarily and so forth. But for all intents and purposes, it was a waste Void city. I mean, there was nothing there, so it wouldn't do any point to, to, to live there because there was, there was, there was just a pile of rubbles and so forth. There's nowhere for you to live. You know, the same thing happened with God said with Babylon when it was originally destroyed. Question. You know, I said that, that the largest city in the world was now barren and laid waste. But the question is asked: Who will bemoan her and and be comforters for her? The question is self-answered, as there will be no one who will mourn over her loss, as she was so wicked. People will actually do the, the opposite and will rejoice upon hearing of her and her destruction, especially since no one ever thought they would see this day come. You know, remember, she was hated by virtually all the nations because she was such a wicked, powerful nation that, you know, she was not popular among not only the nations, but people in general. You know, she conquered all these people. Remember, the people that, that were destroying her, these were people she'd already conquered, the Babylonians, the Medes, and the Scythians, and so forth, but mainly the Babylonians, going in there and destroying her. And, you know, they, they, I said how they were so wicked and the amount of stuff that they did. You know, they, they were not a well-liked people. So, you know, people aren't going to, you know, other than the people that, or Syrians himself, most of them had been destroyed. There was nobody left in the city, so there wasn't any of them to, to be mowing the city. And, you know, the, the other people, uh, uh, non-Assyrians, they were going to rejoice. You know, they, they, they were going to sit there and rejoice that their enemy had been destroyed. You know, they never really thought that this day would come. Assyria had been such a powerful nation that nobody could defeat her, that they never really thought this would be possible. But God showed otherwise. And destroyed her and showed that no matter what that you know her pride and so forth that you know pride come for destruction and he he destroyed that city just as he said he would that he wasn't going to put up with Nineveh and her wickedness anymore and so now the people rejoiced over this situation I think we'll go ahead and um, I was gonna try to get more done but otherwise I won't have a whole lot for, for next week so I think we'll go ahead and Stop there. Let's see. Well, yeah. Yeah, we'll go ahead and, and, and stop there. And next week will probably be about the same length of time, give or take. So, uh, but I don't want to 
end up only having like 10 minutes or something for next week, so I don't want to go too long tonight. So We'll uh, stop there. We'll have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us here to just continue in our study on Naum. We thank you, Lord, for your word that you've given us here and the opportunity that you do allow us to just study your word for those who, who want to study your word. And Father, I do pray that all Christians should want to study your word and we can learn from it so that we can also learn from the, the sins of these other people that maybe this nation itself, you know, America, we ourselves would turn around and repent of our sins. If the Christians themselves would get right with you, Lord, that's the main thing. You know, the sinners are always going to be sinners. But the, the, the professing Christians need to get right with you, Lord. So that way, we'll be voting for the right people in office. We'll be making the right stands. You know, you won't have Christians standing for things to go against your word. They'll be wanting to go out there and witness to the world and try to win souls for you, Lord. And we'd see things change in this nation. If just the Christians themselves, the people that profess to be Christians, would do what, what's written in your word, Lord. And Father, we just ask that you bless all those that are listening and they're here. And we just continue to ask for your blessings on me, your servant, Lord. Just be with me throughout the various situations in life. And Father, we just ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.